this lesson is on only the signs and symptoms of meningitis. If you want more information on how this condition is diagnosed and treated, please check out my full lesson on this topic. Before we get into the signs and symptoms of meningitis, what is meningitis? It is a condition involving inflammation of the meninges. And the meninges are layers that cover the brain and spinal cord. Here is a diagram showing those layers. One of those is known as the pia mater, another one is the arachnoid mater, and the other one is the dura mater. And these three layers cover the brain and also extend down through the spinal cord. So they cover the spinal cord as well. This is going to be important when we talk about the signs and symptoms of meningitis. Now there are a variety of causes of meningitis. Some of these include viruses, so enteroviruses and herpes viruses like herpes simplex virus one and two can all cause meningitis and there are even more viruses that can lead to meningitis as well. Bacteria like Neisseria meningitidis, strep pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, Listeria monocytogenes, all of these bacteria can cause meningitis and there are even more bacteria that can lead to meningitis as well. And then certain fungi can lead to meningitis. These include Cryptococcus and Coccidioides. And then some non-infectious causes of meningitis include lupus and sarcoidosis. So as you can see, there are many different causes of meningitis. Now, what is the epidemiology and risk factors for getting meningitis? So the epidemiology shows that 1.38 per 100,000 people are affected by meningitis with a median age of 41.9 years. And these numbers are from the United States. Patients with immunocompromised are at an increased risk. So because they're at an increased risk for getting infections in general, they're also at an increased risk for getting meningitis as well. And then there's an increased risk in patients who are unimmunized, especially children, and especially those unimmunized against certain bacteria like Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenzae. And individuals with abnormalities in their nasal pharynx are at an increased risk for meningitis as well. Most often these infective organisms infect the meninges through the nasal pharynx. They traverse the nasal pharynx and get into the meninges to infect the meninges and cause meningitis. So individuals with abnormalities in the nasal pharynx, whether that be congenital abnormalities or from trauma, are at an increased risk for getting meningitis, and that is the reason why. Now that we know all those introductory facts, let's talk about the particular signs and symptoms that occur in meningitis. One of them is a stiff, painful neck. So this is a very, very important symptom of meningitis. It's also known as nuchal rigidity, and it is a resistance to neck flexion. So if you were to try to passively flex someone's neck, so you try to get them to touch their chin to their chest, it becomes very, very difficult. It's very painful, and in some cases, it can be nearly impossible for them to actually touch their chin to their chest because of the pain. This is due to inflamed meninges that activate certain nerve fibers. So because of these activated nerve fibers, moving the neck can be very difficult and very painful. Now there are particular clinical signs that can be performed by a clinician to assess whether this patient has meningitis. Now the patient doesn't necessarily have to have these clinical signs, but if they do, it helps support the diagnosis of meningitis. One of them is known as Brzezinski sign. So Brzezinski sign is when there is passive flexion of the neck that results in involuntary flexion of the hips and knees. So I mentioned before that it can be very difficult to passively flex someone's neck to try to get them to touch their chin to their chest. But if you were to actually do that motion, if they have Brzezinski sign, what happens is they involuntarily flex their hips and their knees. And then the other clinical sign is Koenig sign. Koenig sign is when a clinician has a patient lying down flat and the patient has their hip flexed at a 90 degree angle and the clinician tries to extend the patient's knee and there is resistance. That is Koenig sign. So those are two particular clinical signs that can occur in patients with meningitis, although they don't necessarily have to. So I just want to mention that here. Some other important signs and symptoms of meningitis include fever, so a temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius or greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit by oral temperature recording. But oftentimes it's going to be a very high fever in meningitis and it often occurs suddenly. So it's a sudden high fever. And this is due to infection and inflammation of the meninges. You can imagine that if a part of the layers that cover the brain are inflamed, there's going to be a very high fever. Now, patients can also experience altered mental status as well. So altered mental status in these patients can manifest as difficulty concentrating, decreased alertness, or confusion. So altered mental status, along with fever and stiff neck, makes up the classic triad of symptoms of meningitis. So these are the classic 
triad of symptoms, but they're only present in a minority of patients. Roughly 40% of patients with meningitis are going to have all three of these. And this can be due to that inflamed meninges that surrounds the brain. This can lead to issues with cognition. Now, headache can also occur in patients with meningitis. The headache is noted to be worsened with lying down flat. So headache in meningitis is noted to be worsened with lying down flat. This headache often feels different and more severe. It's not a typical headache where some muscle strain is causing a headache. It is the meninges, the layers that cover the brain that are inflamed. So it's going to have a different sensation and it's going to be more severe. And again, this is due to inflammation of those meningeal layers. Photophobia and possibly phonophobia can also occur in meningitis. So photophobia is a sensitivity to light and phonophobia is a sensitivity to sound. So in meningitis, it's more likely that photophobia or sensitivity to light is going to be involved or going to be present in patients as opposed to phonophobia or sensitivity to sound. Although phonophobia can occur in patients with meningitis, but photophobia is going to be more common. And this is caused by meningeal irritation from inflamed meninges. Patients with meningitis can also have malaise and fatigue. So they can have a sensation of feeling very tired and a general sense of feeling unwell. You can imagine that if the layers that cover the brain and spinal cord are inflamed, they're going to feel very ill and feel very unwell. Again, this is due to inflammation and infection of the meninges. Patients with meningitis can also have nausea and vomiting. And along with some of those other signs and symptoms we talked about before, like fever, nausea and vomiting can be among some of the earlier symptoms of meningitis. So nausea and vomiting, fever, some of those can be some of the earlier symptoms of meningitis. And this nausea and vomiting can be due to inflamed and swollen meninges and increased pressure, or increased intracranial pressure, or ICP, within the central nervous system. Anorexia can also occur in meningitis patients. These patients can note a reduced or loss of appetite. And this is essentially due to having an infection and feeling very unwell. A lot of times patients will not have much of an appetite. Patients with meningitis can also have a skin rash, and this can be a very important manifestation in some cases of meningitis. In some patients with meningitis, they may have a maculopapular rash that occurs on the trunk and extremities. So they can have this maculopapular rash on the trunk and extremities, and they can also have petechiae and purpura. So there can be little spots of blood under the skin. And this skin rash can start out as a blanching rash and then become non-blanching over time. Now, this maculopapular rash is more likely to occur in meningeal cockle infections or infections caused by Neisseria meningitidis. So meningitis caused by Neisseria meningitidis or meningeal cockle infections can cause this type of rash. So this can be a sign that that is the infective organism. So meningeal cockal septicemia. And then some other skin manifestations can include vesicular lesions, which may occur in HSV-induced meningitis. So herpes simplex virus vesicles can also be noted in some patients who have meningitis if HSV is the causative organism. Patients with meningitis can also have cold extremities. So this can include decreased temperature in hands and feet. And this can be due to septicemia, so having bacteria in the blood and septic shock that may occur concomitantly with meningitis. So septicemia and septic shock can occur at the same time as meningitis if it's a very severe case. And this can lead to shock where there's not enough blood supply getting to the extremities like the hands and the feet. That's why we can see cold extremities occurring. And the myalgias and arthralgias can also occur in meningitis. Myalgias are muscle aches and pains and arthralgias are joint aches and pains. These can both occur in meningitis as well. And then we alluded to this before that increased intracranial pressure can occur in meningitis. And there are particular signs and symptoms that can occur with increased intracranial pressure. We talked about one of them being nausea and vomiting, but another one can be papilledema. Now, papilledema is the swelling of the optic nerve due to increased intracranial pressure. You can see here that there is a swollen optic nerve, and this can be noted on fundoscopic examination. So when an ophthalmologist looks into the eye, they can see this. They can see papilledema, and this can be a sign of increased intracranial pressure. And seizures can also occur as well when there's increased intracranial pressures. And seizures and coma may occur in severe cases of meningitis and if there's meningeal encephalitis or when the brain is also inflamed along with the meninges. So this can also be something that can occur in meningitis patients. And then there can be some cranial nerve palsies that can occur in meningitis as well. 
The inflamed and swollen meninges and other structures inside the cranium can impinge and compress certain cranial nerves. So this can be a very important sign of meningitis. Particular cranial nerves can be affected in meningitis. These include cranial nerve 7, which is the facial nerve, and cranial nerve 8, which is the vestibulococcular nerve. So with the facial nerve, there may be some facial hemiparesis. So trying to get the patient to smile and lift their eyebrows, these might be affected asymmetrically. So half of their face may not perform as well as the other half. This may indicate a palsy of the facial nerve. And then with regards to the vestibulococcular nerve, this can lead to issues with hearing. So this can be something that can occur with meningitis as well. And cranial nerve 3 or the oculomotor nerve can also be affected, but it is most often less commonly affected than these other cranial nerves in meningitis. So if cranial nerve 3 or the oculomotor nerve is affected, we get down and out and we get ptosis. So down and out, the eye goes down and out. And this is because the other cranial nerves are unaffected. So different cranial nerves control different muscles around the eye. Some of the cranial nerves control the lateral muscles and some of them control the more medial muscles that control the movement of the eye. So if there is palsy of one set of cranial nerves, in this case, cranial nerve three, but the other cranial nerves that control the movement of the eyes is not affected, the unaffected cranial nerve is going to outcompete the affected cranial nerve, in this case, cranial nerve three. And then ptosis can also be affected. Ptosis is a drooping eyelid. So this can occur as well with cranial nerve three palsy or oculomotor nerve palsy. So these are some other signs and symptoms that can occur in meningitis as well. If you want more information on encephalitis, please check out my lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks much for watching and I hope to see you next time.